And uh, I'm a big fan. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so today uh, I asked Pam, oh yeah, kids can go as they already are. Awesome. You guys are on the ball and I'm not. Um, yeah, I'd ask Pam to uh, take an opportunity today to share, uh, to share her heart with you. Uh, this is not necessarily a, a feel-good, special mom's message, but it's, uh, I believe it's a word from the Lord for us today. So, let her rip. <laughs> That's dangerous, man. Dangerous, dangerous man. Although he lives with me, he's pretty brave. All right. Okay. Happy Mother's Day. Good morning. Welcome to our Mother's Day service. Although it's already been great, we could probably all go home now. In fact, I had a man ask me this morning, this is for women, right? I don't need to stay. I said, no, it's for warriors. So stick around. All right. What a privilege to come together with church family and celebrate. Chelsea, there's lots of seats up here. You don't need to stand. Just saying. I had a good morning. I have three kids. Um, two of them live with me, or us. So this morning, they bring me breakfast in bed. Chelsea actually says, I feel like we, I've been doing this my whole life. I said, I've been your mother your whole life, yeah. <laughs> so they, they bring me breakfast in bed, which is a tradition. So they bring it in, and, and uh, so the kids come in, and my oldest daughter doesn't live at home. So Andrew was carrying an odd pad, and she was FaceTiming. So it was his body and her face. So uh, they all sang and stuff. And, and, I, and at one moment, I went, wow, I'm the mom to Cameron, Chelsea, and poor connection. Because that's what it said on the screen. It said poor connection. <laughs> anyway, she could hear us anyway. So. <laughs> and hey, I got a great blow dryer. That's what I asked for. I need a new blow dryer. Um, I'm not sure you can tell, but I got a new blow dryer, and uh, it weighs, the, it's, it weighs like, a, it's as heavy as a car. Like, it, the motor in it, I picked it up and went, I, you know what, they, they're caring about my fitness. So I get to blow dry my hair and lift weights at the same time. I thought that was funny. I'm not sure what it's going to do to my hair, though. <laughs> oh, it's all good. All right. So, we all have a mom. <laughs> some of them were fantastic, some of them were great, some of them not so great. A lot of us are moms, some of us are fantastic moms, and some of us are not so great. I'm kind of like, you know what, I don't want to give the same Mother's Day message we hear every year. I don't know if you guys have heard Mother's Day messages, so I guess I'm kind of assuming that, but oftentimes, Mother's Day messages look like, you're so very special, thank you for what you do. We love you. You are God. You know, you reflect God to us, which is all true. That's all amazing. That's all very, very true. I just think we need to go a little farther. So I um, was digging in the Word, and I found a story of a woman in the Bible. I'm not even sure she was a mother, but I thought we're going to look at her story this morning and, and learn a few things. Um, see, I think that to be a mother, you don't actually have to biologically birth children. I think mother is actually a verb and not a noun. I have many, many women in my life that have mothered me. And I have mothered many, many, many women, children, boys and girls, that I didn't birth. Now, I want credits. I want credit for the ones I did birth, just for the record. <laughs> but there are many I haven't that I get to mother. And I just I'm gonna throw that out there. So um, we all get to do that. So I'm going to get you to open your Bibles your Bible, your app, your iPad, your phone, whatever you have, to Judges chapter 4. And if you don't have a Bible on you, I won't say shame on you, but you are weaponless at the moment. Makes you a little vulnerable. You might want to think about carrying a weapon. All right. Judges chapter 4. I'm going to give you a little bit of historical context. There's some players in this story, Okay. Um, Israel, in chapter 4, verse 1, in history, in case you haven't noticed, Israel has a lot of ups and downs as a nation, right? Like you can go through all, you know, 
Judges, Joshua, Kings, you go through all that section of the Old Testament, you see that they came back to God, they turned their back on God, started worshiping idols, and then he allowed them to be conquered and helped them to learn. Then they cry out to God, and, and he delivers them, and hopefully they learn, and, and the cycle goes on and on, right? Reading that, pa- that part of the Bible, have any of you noticed that? All right, yes. Okay. <laughs> So in chapter 4, verse 1, it says that Israel did evil in the sight of God. And it talks about how uh, they ended up being cruelly oppressed by uh, Jabin. Okay, He was actually the king of the city of Hazar. And Hazar is one of the cities in the Canaan, the the region of Canaan. Okay, So Hazar is one of the cities. Jabin is the king. And Jabin's general of his army is Sisera. Okay, And Sisera... He's actually pretty big stuff in that time and place. He had the cutting edge technology, okay? So the other armies really didn't stand a chance against him. Cutting edge technology at that point was iron chariots. So he had 900 iron chariots. So he was a big deal and he pretty much dominated the area. He was, he was the guy, got what he wanted and wasn't very nice. I think the phrase the Bible uses is cruelly oppressed Israel, so you can imagine. So Sisera, yeah, he was the general of Jabin. I wrote this down so I wouldn't do too many bunny trails. I think that was a good idea. So I'm going to go back to my writing. Is that okay? (laughs) He had 900 chariots, cutting edge technology at the time. He would have believed and acted like the boss, got what he wanted when he wanted it. He was a military power in that day and in that region. Another character in this story is Deborah. She was a prophetess. She was the wife of Lipidoth. I can see why she went by Deborah instead of Mrs. Lipidoth. But she was, she was a prophetess and the leader of Israel at the time. When the Israelites get in trouble, they would cry out to God. And God answered them by giving them brave leaders called judges. The first judge was Joshua. And there were a few other noteworthy ones in that time. Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. Not an easy gig for a woman in those days. But she pulled it off. There weren't that many female judges. She was full of the Holy Spirit, and she heard from God. So she led well. She led very well. The Bible talks about her sitting under a certain tree, and she was full of the Holy Spirit and led well. Barak. Barak? Sort of like Obama, but not. Barak. Okay. He was the general of the Israelite army. Now, you have to understand, the Israelite army at that point did not have 900 chariots. The Israelite army at that point had pitchforks. <laughs> they were um, farmers, okay, and they were kind of in the area, and they, they had been cruelly oppressed for many years. He seems kind of cowardly. I don't know if that's fair, because he probably had all the bravery beaten out of him a while ago. Um, kind of like farmers with pitchforks going to, to fight against elite warriors, so he was kind of used to losing. So that's one character. And the last character I want to talk about was J.L., okay? She was a tent dweller, a nomad. Her family were tinsmiths who made farming utensils and weapons. They traveled whenever they could find work. Her campsite must have been close to the battlefield because her family was making and supplying weapons for the army. Hebar, Heber, Jael's hubby, had kinship ties with Israel. He had descended from Jethro, that's Moses' father-in-law. And he was bound to the Israelites by kinship obligations. Nevertheless, he was a sensible businessman, so he kept on really good terms with the Canaanites, so, you know, he could get the military contracts. That was kind of... So when Sisera came running and saw Jael's tent, he would have known that they were friendly. Would have seen it as a refuge. So I'm going to read from chapter 4. You got your Bibles? All righty. I'm going to tell the story, and I'm going to talk about four things. Then I'm going to take four things and how they apply to us, just so you all know what I'm doing. Is that good? I hope it won't take too long. All right. (laughs) So Deborah is a prophetess and a leader at the time, and she's filled with the Holy Spirit. So she gets a message from God. She wants to, um, well, and she wants to deliver the message. So I'm going to start at verse, sorry, got bifocals here, believe it or not. I'm going to start at verse 6. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you 10,000 men of Natali and Zebulun, and lead the way to Mount Tabor. 
I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Okay, Barak's going, um, okay, maybe. Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I'm not going. Very well, Deborah said. I will go with you, and because of the way you are going about this, not trusting the Lord, the honor will not be yours, but the Lord will, give, will hand Sisera over to a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh, where he summoned Zebulon and Naphtali. 10,000 men followed him, and Deborah also went with him. And there's some details there. We're going to skip ahead to verse 14 for the sake of time. Then, and Sisera gathered all his 900 chariots, and they were on their way. Then Deborah said to Barak, go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. So that was just like a verse or two, but that actually would have been quite a long process to gather 10,000 men and Sisera and all the pieces get in place, okay? So it wasn't overnight, it took a little bit of time, but then Barak's waiting and waiting and waiting and Deborah gets the word from the Lord and says, okay. Deborah says to Barak, go, this is the day that the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor, followed by 10,000 men. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera. Okay, routed. Someone give me a new English word for that, Andrew. Routed. Basically wiped him out. Spanked. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So basically, he routed Sisera and all his chariots and armies by the sword. And Sisera abandoned his chariot and fled on foot. But Barak pursued. So basically, the Lord came in and gave Sisera the victory beyond explanation of any kind. 10,000 men descend, 900 iron chariots are not a match. The Lord routed Sisera. Every single person in Sisera's army is dead except Sisera. Yeah, he was pretty much creamed. Okay, but Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Heresheth Egoyim. All the troops of Sisera fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Sisera, however, fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Canaanite, because they were friendly relations between Jabin, king of Hazar, and the clan of Heber, the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come right in, don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she put a covering over him. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her, and if someone comes and says, Is there anyone here? Say no. But Jael, Heber's knife, pick Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died. A little violent. These were violent times. Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera and Jael went out to meet him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So she went in with him, or he went in with her, and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple dead. On that day, God subdued Chabon, the Canaanite king, before the Israelites, and the hand of the Israelites grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, the Canaanite king, until they destroyed him. It was a real turning point for the nation of Israel. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. (laughs) So Jael, in, in that whole battle scene where God did that, Nobody can do that. I mean, I think there was mud involved, and there was a whole bunch of miscommunication and so on, but the Israelite army, which is armed with pitchfork, I mean, exaggerating, but they were n- not nearly as ready or w- weapon-ready as 900 chariots, and they were destroyed. The Lord showed off that day, showed up, showed off, and did his thing. However, J.L. offers... I've, I was thinking about this this week. So J.L. offers refuge to Sisera, like, why would she do that? Or not exactly why. He's fleeing a huge battle where he's the sole survivor. He may have felt like, she may have felt like she didn't have a choice. He was going to hide there anyway. She may have seen an opportunity to slow him down until the enemy caught up. However, she gave him warm milk and hid him, and he asked her to lie for him if anyone came looking. As he sleeps, she realizes that no one is following him. <laughs> she knows that he may or may not make all kinds of demands on her when he wakes up. She knew that socially she could be in serious trouble for having a man in her tent. She knows that if her husband, Heber, finds him there, she'll be accused of adultery and stoned. So she took like a serious risk here. So faced with a man who was far superior to her in physical strength, J.L. used her wits and her courage. She took the wooden hammer used to put up her tent and one of the pegs that held the tent rope. And then with an expert blow, she drove the peg deep into the side of his head and defeated the enemy. 
Interesting, the last verse talks about how this was a turning point in Israel's history. I'm not advocating violence, okay? I'm not up here saying you... Okay. Just trying to draw some lessons from a very violent time in history where um, God will use a willing vessel. God will give you opportunities that you get to jump and be a part of. All right, so that was a turning point in history. I want to talk to you about a couple characteristics of JL. And I'm trying to watch the time because I've been given a limit by my husband who only preaches very short. Okay. (sighs) Just going to leave that there. All right. (laughs) So I want to talk to you about four characteristics of JL and, um, and how they can be something that we ascribe to. I, I, this is of course directed at the women, but men, you know what, you can learn too. Just saying. Okay. So one thing, one thing about JL, she was not a victim. She was victorious. She lived in a culture where women were treated mm, not that much better than cattle. I don't want to get into all the historical context, and it's not that way anymore, but at that snapshot in history, at that time, women were not generally valued as, as equals or really valued at all. So she could have chosen to be a victim. In that cultural setting, uh, it been very easy for her to feel like a victim in a man's world. In this situation, there was nothing she could do, but she was not willing to be stuck there. Rather, by seizing the moment in front of her, she acted with courage, and it turned the tide on the battle really affected the entire nation. Hmm. I want to acknowledge the fact that um, in our own lives, sometimes there are things that we don't have a lot of control over and we can be victimized, right? But that doesn't mean that we stay a victim. Yeah, because in a room this size, sorry, I've worked with a lot of uh, trauma victims and different things, and in a room this size, probably half the woman, women have been abused or molested in some way. So I want to acknowledge the fact that we can be victimized. This isn't me just saying that, you know what, oh. but we don't have to stay a victim. There's a big difference. There's a big, big difference there. Sometimes there are things that happen in our lives. Maybe it's a disappointment. Maybe it's deep emotional wounding. Maybe it's abuse. Maybe it's sin. All of these can be reasons that we can't clearly see ourselves the way God does or the way he wants us to. I don't want to trivialize any of these. I want to encourage you to turn to Jesus. He can handle your disappointment. He can handle your pain. And he can handle your sin. None of that scares him. The woman that God sees when he looks at you is not a victim. Just saying. Hmm. Turn to Jesus. He can handle your disappointment, pain, and sin. He brings healing and forgiveness. This is really important. I don't know that we've always done a really great job in the church of talking about it. Just throwing that out there. It's paramount. Jesus is enough. Sometimes I think sermons or messages maybe are geared more at women. Just stop here and say that once we receive healing and encouragement and our self-esteem is okay, then we're just fine. Everything is fine. Yes, there's healing. Yes, there's hope. But I just want to challenge each day that there's more. It's not enough to just survive. God calls us to thrive. And he has a destiny on every one of your lives that only you can fulfill. Throwing that out there. All right, back to characteristics of J.L. She was not a victim, she was victorious. She knew her history. So she wasn't a victim. Um, She could have felt not important, really, in the grand scheme of things. She was a nomad in the desert, wandering around. It doesn't seem that that was the case. Uh, She knew her history. If you look in Judges 3, um, I don't know if you want to go there now, I'm watching the clock, hon. I'm watching the clock. Okay, Judges 3, 12 to 25. She would have been familiar with the legendary Ehud, Ehud, who 
um, had kind of, she would have been familiar with it. Because, you know, now in our day and age, we hear stories, things that are happening, or now social media helps with that, I suppose. But we hear stories of what's happening in our day and age. We know the news. Now, they didn't have social media in those days, but when something significant happened in their country, it tr traveled word of mouth, like wildfire. So they would have known the history. They did a really good job, actually, of preserving their history. They would have known what was happening in the next town and, and so on. And so this was a pretty important story. Ehud was a Benjaminite who recently drove, again, violence, I'm not advocating violence, drove a knife into the heart of King Eglon of the Moabites during the Israel's last cycle of oppression. You know how I said they kind of go through this cycle, right? They turn their back on God, start worshiping idols, end up being oppressed, cry out to God, he delivers them. So this was the last cycle that they were in, okay? And they were crying out to God. Ehud was another king who brutally treated the Israelites or pardon me, Eglon was another king who brutally treated the Israelites uh, for 18 years, again, a punishment handed down by God because of Israel's unfaithfulness and idolatry. Ehud wisely befriended the king by giving him presents and praise, and he eventually made him welcome in the king's court. In the heat of the day, the king and Ehud sat together in the parlor, talking, laughing, and sharing stories. With no one else around, Ehud told the king of a private dream he wanted to share and whispered for the king to come close. The king, trusting Ehud, obliges, and Ehud stabbed him in the heart. And with a treacherous sleight of hand. So Jay, actually, that was a real turning point for the nation of Israel, too. So Jael would have known that story. She knew the story. She knew that maybe this was an opportunity for her to make a difference. She would have known that. Ultimately, again, not encouraging violence. <laughs> but there was a method. There was a method. And the third thing uh, of Jael when I talked about was her resourcefulness. She was a nomad, okay? So <laughs> if her husband, they were, they were tinsmiths and they were making weapons, what happens when a battle moves? You pack up your tent, hubby comes home, hubby Haber, whatever his name was, comes home and says, okay, got to move. So groan, groan, groan. Shoot, here we go again. Pack everything up, you know, in the caravan or the minivan or whatever they had, and just load everything up and go find another place in the desert. And I have to tell you, the tent pegs that we think of with our tents, you know, the little yellow plastic ones, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah? No? Okay. Those were not the tent pegs that they used. <laughs> they would have had, like, desert ground and hard dirt. They would have had to deal with, like, serious. She was, she was actually, how many times had she been pounding in tent pegs? without even realizing it's something that was God was going to use in her life. It was a chore. It was training, though. Hmm, interesting. So she would have been an expert tent peg driver. She'd been in training and didn't even know it. Every time her hubby, Haybar, came home and said, okay, time to move. There's some soldiers, two oases over, and they're looking for weapons. She must have grown. Can you imagine driving tent pegs into hard desert? This was just part of her life. And another part about J.L. was she could have been very fearful. That was a day and age when fear was very much a part of women's lives. But she was fierce. When there was an opportunity to present itself, she took it. When I read that and I think, my mind goes to, um, <laughs> as a mom, what we let in our home. There's a protective... There's a protective sensitivity, and, and we're the tone setter in the home, and there's something about knowing what's in our home, influences, um, what we allow in our home, attitudes, what we allow in our home. There's a protective, okay, um, maybe I'm just talking to, you guys look like you're falling asleep on me. Has anyone ever had a moment where, as mom or dad in your home, you just have this kind of, uh, 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 something's off. Something's off. Hmm. Let's, let's look at this. Maybe there's something, you know, a little flag going up. <laughs> okay, God, what, what is it and what do we need to deal with and what have we allowed into our home now because this is a refuge, this is a sanctuary, this is a safe place. And God leads you in, in understanding what it is that you need to oust, whether it's influences, this, that, the other thing. No? Yes? Okay, well, I, oh, thank you. So I, I believe that she was being protective of her home. 
This is a, a very evil man who led very evil men and was in her home. And there's like a, a righteousness kind of, or an indignation or something that rises up in us. Hmm. Yeah, she was pushed. And in that moment, she was a warrior. Hmm. Before I talk about the lessons we can take from the attributes of Jael, it's, I talked about healing and wholeness, how we, yes, may deal with difficult things, but God doesn't want us to get stuck there. Sometimes I think that we live in the moment where we think, I'm going to survive this, I'm not going to thrive, and we lose, we lose sight maybe of the big picture of what God wants to do in and through our lives. And um, in some of these things we're discussing, it's, we can get stuck on thinking it's about the destination down there someday, when really it's about the journey, everyday stuff, being a part of the big destiny and the, and the big picture. Mm. So we may always be on a healing journey if we've had difficult things happen in our lives. And you may not be able to see yourself yet the way God does. But he still calls you to put one foot in front of the other and walk into every opportunity he puts in front of you. He needs you and the people around you need you. When I talk about JL could have chose to be a victim but she was victorious, You are overcomers. You know what's really cool? <clears throat> in that day and age, okay, in that violent, horrible picture in history, <laughs> the only person in that whole story that heard from God really was Deborah because she was full of the Holy Spirit. After Jesus came, day of Pentecost, Holy Spirit came, every single one of us get to hear from the Holy Spirit. Okay? So Deborah, who's saying... This is, it is time, it is time for you to fight the enemy. God is going to make a way. Now is the day. You've been preparing, you've been preparing, and now is the day. Guess what? Every one of us hear from Holy Spirit. Now is the day. Take this step. Jump at this opportunity. Make a stand for righteousness. Pursue me. God talks to us. We need to hear it. Okay, digress. Sorry. All right. So victorious. JL could have been a victim, but she was victorious. In our lives. <laughs> it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. I am a victori I'm victorious. I am an overcomer. Because I'm awesome? No, because God is awesome. Amen. So are you. Hmm. 4,000 years later, sometimes it's still easy for women to fall into a victim role, to feel like they have no options. It doesn't matter what you've been through. And again, I'm not trivializing people that have dealt with a lot of pain. It doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter how hard life has been. You do not need to be a victim. Jesus has made you victorious. And this is how I fight my battles. No, I don't need you on the instruments. Thanks for the offer, Cameron. <laughs> He's always looking to show, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right. So we are not victims. We're victorious. History maker. You know, uh, JL knew the story of Ehud, and that, that may or may not have been her inspiration. I don't know. All I know is something led up to that moment where she made a decisive action and um, changed the course of the history of her nation. Della's smiling in the back because she knows exactly what I'm going to say next. Every one of you can be history makers, right? <laughs> Every one of you. You all hear from Holy Spirit. God has given you a realm of influence, whether it's your home, your workplace. I don't know where. I don't know what realm of influence he's given you, but you get to be a history maker there. 
hmm, resourceful, what's in your hand? Oh no, is there, um, <clears throat> is there moments when your job, your husband, your kids, your whatever happens and you groan and moan? Here we go again, got to pack up the tent, got to move it, got to drive in tent pegs again. Or, in the middle of God calling you to do something, are you being trained for action? Are you being trained? Jael did not know that when she was, <laughs> I'm assuming she was mumbling and grumbling a little bit. I would. Maybe it's not safe for me to assume that of her. <laughs> Got to set all, and these aren't like little tiny pup tents. These are major huge tents. Got to set all the tents up again, move them. Oh, I wish you'd make us mind. We were only there two weeks. Here we go again. <sighs> she was being trained. So my question is, what in our lives, oh, it's so much easier to say your lives. <laughs> what in our lives is God asking us to do? And we're going, oh, I just did this. I don't want to do this again. How haven't I learned this? God, do you know what you're doing? And meanwhile, he's training us. Our attitudes, our actions. Okay. It's really quiet in here. God wants to use what's in your hand. She had a temp peg. What have you got? Money? Skills? Opportunities and moments to speak into people's lives? Love? Compassion? Kindness? What have you got? How you spend your money shows your heart, Dave. Not just you, all of us. How you spend your money shows your heart. Okay. And fierce. She was fierce. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to dwell on that too much because it is extremely violent. <laughs> but there's a guy in your house in the next room and he's having a nap. He's exhausted. He's just, you know, been had his butt handed to him. I don't know how you say that. Just had his tail whipped. Whatever. He was just beat. He's run for his life. He's exhausted. It was really smart of her to give him milk because it was probably a little fermented. Maybe, maybe not. Probably would have helped him sleep really sound. Pretty smart. Next room, hides him under a rug. Pretty smart. Okay. She's pretty smart. She got him, him all ready. But there's a fierceness in that. I could never do that, sorry. But like to actually go into the next room and know that that's, she's, going to, she's going to take his life and change the course of her nation. Again, not advocating violence. I feel the need to say it again. <laughs> but God is going to give you moments in your life where there is a fierceness that rises up in you that has nothing to do with physical violence. There are going to be moments where you see situations that you get to be God, not like God, but you get to do God's work. You get to be obedient to God's leading and voice and make a huge difference in somebody's life or in social justice issues. I don't know. Amen. Thank you. I don't know where that came from, but thank you. So, hey, we got lots of time. I'm done. I'm, I'm pretty much done. But my wrap-up is... It, the woman God sees, and I just, I, I am mushy-gushy, I am sometimes, very much so. I think sometimes we kind of just, you know, limit ourselves almost by our mushy-gushy stuff. So we have these wonderful gifts for women today. The woman God sees, forgiven in Christ, precious, beautiful, chosen, holy, beloved, and an heir to eternal life. This is all true. And if you need to know this and you don't know this yet or you've never heard this before, it is so special and it's so very, very true. Okay? All the women get to come up here in a minute. We're going to give you all one of these. But I kind of wanted to call you a little, <laughs> I kind of wanted to give you a little bit more of a challenge today. Is that Okay. This is good, and this is mushy gushy, and we all need to know this, and yes. 
I just have seen tremendous women warriors that have changed the world. And I don't say that to be negative to men. It's not negative to men at all. Sometimes we forget, though, as women, that we are warriors. No one can pray for your kids like you can because nobody loves your kids like you do. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. (laughs) Anyway. There's a fierceness that stands up in us as intercessors and says, enough. 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 You know, sometimes we sense it in a smaller cosmos in our homes. You know, we get a little check, mm, something's not right, might need to deal with maybe some influences or attitudes. But can we, can we as, sorry guys, but as women stand up and say, something's not right in our region? Something's not right in our region. I had a sexual assault counselor person that I was talking to not that long ago that works here locally that was telling me that besides the native reserves in Canada, this area, northern New Brunswick, has the highest domestic violence and addiction rate. Can we stand up and say that there's something wrong in our region? Okay, man, you're welcome to. I'm not excluding you. I'm going to call all the women to come down. Come on down to the front. We're gonna. We got this special gift for you. It's. It talks about the woman that God sees, and you are precious. And Pastor's gonna come and do a blessing for me. But I want to challenge you today, as you come forward, whether you've physically birthed a child or not, you are a mother. Come on down. If you're 18 or over, whatever. I don't know what the limit is. Is there a limit? <laughs> I just want Yeah, so all the women... Just one more minute. Just give me a minute. Just give me a minute. So before Pastor does a blessing over all these amazing women, my goodness, can we clap? Can we clap for these women? Oh, wow. Look at the wisdom and passion and compassion and look at this I did not visualize it being this long that's awesome that's amazing okay I just want to say again that I'm not advocating anyone getting tent pegs okay okay (laughs) Um, but what I want to say is we look at JL in the Bible and she can inspire us to not be victims to be the warrior that God's called you to be, to be a history maker. You could be the linchpin in the turning point of our nation or the people that you rally. I don't know. What is God asking you to do? You are an overcomer. You are a history maker. You are resourceful and you are fierce. And God has work for you that only you can do. And we need you. We desperately need you to walk in what's in front of you. So that's my challenge to you today before Pastor does a blessing. Thank you. So ladies, um, I'm going to get any of the the youth in the house, we're going to get you to come up and get ready to hand out um, the gifts here. So youth, come on up. We want to just recognize, too, uh, uh, Mrs. Fraser's out after uh, she wasn't able to come out through the winter, but uh, great to have you here with us. Yeah. So, guys, just hold on to those for just a moment. Um, So, ladies, 
in the name of Jesus, we recognize today the beauty of who you are, the beauty of how God made you. You are precious. You are His princess. You are His darling. And He made you the way He wanted to make you because He wanted you to shine in this world just as you are. And in the name of Jesus, we bless you to be the woman that God created you to be. We bless you to break every box that anyone ever tries to put you in. And we bless you to be the woman that God made you to be. We bless you to walk in His love and His kindness. We bless you to walk in the healing power of His presence in your life. We bless you to, as Pam said at the beginning of her message, to mother, whether you are a biological mother or not, we bless you to mother the people in your life that God has brought into your life to speak into, to encourage, to strengthen with the nurturing love that He has put in you that is so special. We bless you to walk in strength and wholeness. We bless you to be a blessing wherever you go. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you, ladies. Um, these guys are going to give you a, uh, a little gift. They're going to come and bring it around right now really fast and, uh, and bring those to you. All right. Just a small token from our church to say we honor you. We value you today. You are precious in the Lord's sight, and you are precious to us. All right? And uh, would all the rest in the house just stand with us as we, uh, we're just going to close our service today with the word of prayer. Oh, yes. We're going we're gonna, We're going to pray, and then you can sit down for just another moment because there's one more thing that has to happen. Father, we love you. We thank you for the gift of these ladies and what they bring into this world. And Father, we pray that you would strengthen them and help them today as they walk walk away from this service. I pray that they would walk away knowing, God, your, your love for them, your kindness toward them, and the way that you want to unleash them on this world. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Guys, come on up. I'm being summoned. I'm not sure what for here, but I'll give you a mic. Oh, you got one. Here, Suzanne, you can have a mic. I can't seem to turn it off. (laughs) Okay, I'm asked this morning to, uh, when I come into the house of the Lord this morning, I was asked uh, what happened to my arm. Well, I just want to say, especially to the gentleman out there, it's Mother's Day today, and don't forget it. Kathy reminded me of that when I got up. Okay? (laughs) So what I would like to do now, on a more serious note, I'd like to uh, call Pam, the pastor's wife, over. Yeah. And Pam, on behalf of the board and the church congregation, I'd like to present you with this little token for Mother's Day. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. That's very thoughtful. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Uh, happy Mother's Day. 
Yeah, thanks, Richard. I'm okay. Not, I'm not preaching. <laughs> That's it. They're all waiting for me to open it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Happy Mother's Day. If you're a mom, make sure you get spoiled. If you're a kid, make sure you spoil your mom. And if you're a dad, make sure you spoil.